The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Thanks a lot for helping us with our research project today. We're interested in learning about emblems. They're different in different cultures. Mm -hmm. So although most cultures in the world uh, do this when they mean yes and do this when they mean no, some cultures do not. Well, today I will tell you about the culture that I grew up in, which is uh, the Egyptian. We have a gesture for tomorrow. We do this. This is tomorrow. Yes. I want that. It gets better after tomorrow. Distress. This is fine, this is fine, but this is insulting. Okay. Among human cultures, gestures are as diverse as spoken languages. Very little appears to be universal. But when it comes to human emotion, researchers have found that there are amazing similarities between peoples. How we express our emotions might be the closest thing we have to a common language. Surprise is the briefest emotion. Uh, You can't be surprised for long. I'm the source of the surprise here, and I just was fortunate enough that I had the camera up to my eye, and I was able to capture it. In 1967, Oakland psychologist Paul Ekman set out to resolve a dispute over the nature of human emotions. Charles Darwin had written in 1872 that regardless of their culture, all people possessed the ability to express certain emotions in exactly the same way. On the voyage of the Beagle, he spent five years going around the globe, and he found that wherever he went, he couldn't understand a word they were saying, but he thought he could understand their expressions. And so that suggested to him, these must be universal. By the late 1950s, when Ekman finished his PhD in psychology, Darwin's view had largely faded into the background. Ekman's contemporary, renowned anthropologist Margaret Mead, argued that all human behavior, including our emotions, stems from our particular culture. Everyone assumed Mead was right, because that fit the world view that dominated uh, the West and the East. But I wasn't certain. And how could you be certain? To put Darwin and Mead's opposing views to the test, it was important for Ekman to find an isolated culture. I needed people who had seen no photographs, no film, no television, and few, if any, outsiders. So I could be certain it wasn't watching John Wayne rather than your evolutionary history that might be responsible for similarities. Ekman managed to find the perfect group in New Guinea. Besides some contact with missionaries, the South Foray people lived in isolation. Ekman figured out an easy way to find out how the foray expressed different emotions. Show them three photographs, tell them a simple story, and just let them point to the photograph that fits it. So they would be told a story like your child has died. Which of these three people's child has died? Just point. You're about to fight. Which of these three people? And in four or five weeks, we tested 5% of the culture. Enormous. And the results were resounding. Darwin was right. Ekman confirmed that there are six universal emotions whose expression is recognized by people around the world. Joy, anger, sadness, surprise, fear, and disgust. In the 1980s, he added contempt to the list. You're going to tighten your lips. You can... Since Ekman made his original observations, other researchers have sought to answer the same question. Are emotions the result of nature or nurture? One way to answer that question is to study blind individuals and especially congenitally blind individuals because those individuals could not possibly have learned to model the expressions through observation. Matsumoto found that congenitally blind athletes made the same facial expressions in the same circumstances as sighted athletes. You'd probably guess whether this person won or lost the match. If we take a little close-up on her face, she's got the lip corners being pulled down and the lower lip is being pushed up just a little bit under the chin. This is a classic expression of sadness or distress that you would see in anybody who's having this emotion. 
So if emotions are innate to all humans, they must be useful to us in some way. As it turns out, they're essential for our survival from the moment we're born. Those smiles from our infant are one of the reasons we put up with the crap, but also being told when they're afraid, when they're angry, uh, what's disgusting to them, very important. So you could make the whole argument that the whole reason this system is there is for child rearing. Further proof that emotions serve an evolutionary purpose is that each emotion prepares the body for a specific action. When people have a specific facial expression occur, we know that their body is turning on a unique physiological signature that prepares them to do something. So some people... With Paul Ekman, psychologist David Matsumoto runs the Ekman Group. It's a private company that provides training on how to interpret facial expressions to everyone from terrorism investigators to doctors. Today, he's lecturing a group of San Francisco State University students and faculty. The question was, are you planning to hurt yourself? When you see anger in somebody's face, you know that their heart rate, heart rate is increasing. And, and studies have shown that when the heart rate increases, the circulation of the blood goes mostly to the arms. Anger prepares people to fight. Now, when you're afraid, where do you think the blood goes to? The feet, because fear prepares you to escape. No one wanted to study emotion because it was, it was thought to be such an ephemeral thing that no one could actually measure behaviorally and objectively. And, and Paul Ekman's work was the most important work that led to that ability. After Ekman's findings on universal emotions, he and two colleagues spent seven years creating the Facial Action Coding System, or FACTS for short. The FACTS manual documents all the ways in which our 40 facial muscles can move. A human being can generate 10,000 visibly different expressions, but most of them you'll never see. In a typical conversation, you're going to see less than 100, and only maybe a third of them will be relevant to emotion. The manual is used by law enforcement agents, doctors, and performers, people for whom it's useful to know what emotion someone is really feeling. Stand-up comedian Bill Santiago, visiting San Francisco from New York, is one of the people whose survival relies on his ability to read emotions, especially unhappy ones. Sometimes that's the one pocket in the audience that you care about. Why isn't this guy enjoying it like everybody else? And so that becomes your benchmark. If I can crack that face, I've, I've accomplished something. In order to teach students how to recognize facial expressions, the manual first teaches them how to make the expressions. We asked Santiago to help demonstrate the manual's method. He starts with a muscle action called AU4. And it says lower your eyebrows and pull them together. Okay, that one seemed easy, didn't it? Facts training then combines muscle actions. I'll give you 10, 17. Now I'll give you 10, 15, 17. That's what people learn, they learn facts, and that's what the computer systems that people are madly working on now to try to automate this so you can get automatic recognition in real time of what people are doing with their face. That's around the corner. With funding from the National Institute of Mental Health and the Homeland Security Administration, teams at Carnegie Mellon University and UC San Diego are developing automated facial expressions recognition technology based on facts. This technology would enable a machine to pick up on brief flashes of emotion, just what these students are learning to do. You want to be seeing the thing that flashes in the middle and guess what emotion is being shown. Right now, we train people, either in workshops or by their going online, how to read uh, concealed emotions, uh, what we call micro-expressions. All right, here we go, number one. Most of us won't see them without training, but in an hour's time, you can learn how to see them. Number three. Number four. Number three was fear. Number four is happiness. But learning to read the face for signs of emotion is only the first step towards deriving useful information. Ekman observed this firsthand at an airport where he was training agents on how to pick out suspicious travelers. 
Everyone else is looking around while they're waiting to get through the checkpoint. This car is hanging his head. So you go up to, that's unusual. So you go up to him and you say, uh, pardon me, sir, could you uh, tell me what's the purpose of your trip? And he says, well, I'm on my way to Chicago because I just learned this morning that my brother, who's only 40 years old, died of a heart attack. Why is his head hanging? He's in grief. There are many different reasons why you see signs of emotion or concealed emotion. You need to find out why. Still, the ability for institutions to sense our emotions is an intimidating concept at best. Are we on the cusp of an era when Big Brother will be monitoring our emotions? What is being captured in terms of the behaviors? How is it being analyzed? What's it being used for? Not only for the face, but for all behaviors, should be debated, especially with micro-expressions. These are signs of concealed emotions. So oftentimes, we are not giving our consent for people to read that or pick that up. We have a vested interest in, in generating our research and putting it in the hands of the individuals or the organizations that we believe will put it to good use. And so we are very careful about who we work with for that reason.